David Sloan Wilson is a SUNY Distinguished Professor of Biology and Anthropology at Binghamton University, upstate New York. His new book, The Neighborhood Project, uses evolution uh, in order, it describes how he uses evolution in order to improve his city one block at a time. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, let's just uh, start right in. This is uh, one of the most famous passages from the Origin of Species. It's actually the last paragraph, one of the most poetic passages, in which Darwin says, it is interesting to contemplate a tangled bank and to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other and so dependent upon each other in so complex a manner, have all been produced by the laws acting around us. And I first want to explain what this tangled bank passage means for biology before quickly getting to our own species. What Darwin was saying was that, it, that his theory, which can be summarized so quickly in a few basic principles, variation, organisms vary in just about everything that you might measure, those, vary, those differences often make a difference in terms of survival and reproduction, and then heritability causes those traits to be transmitted from parents to offspring. That those few basic principles have endless applications. This theory can be used to study all aspects of all species. It can be explain the history of life. It can explain how, how each species is so exquisitely adapted to its environment. And yet it can also explain why those adaptations often resemble Rube Goldberg devices and are not at all the way an engineer might build it. It explains the fossil record, the geographical distribution of species, and development. And so all species in the tangled bank, the plants, the worms, the insects, the, the birds, all of them are produced by these same laws acting um, around us. So what Darwin's theory did for the rest of life was to transcend all previous disciplinary boundaries. And for those of us that think about humans, you know, this is a widely appreciated goal. We wish that we had a unified understanding of human nature, and we don't. And the fragmentation of knowledge for the study of humans is an important theme of my talk. What, Dar what, evolution, what Darwin's theory of evolution did was it transcended disciplinary boundaries for the rest of life. This is the primary import of his theory. And it had this magical effect from the very beginning. If you look at the portfolio of what Darwin studied and what uh, Alfred uh, Russell Wallace studied, you can see that right from the very beginning, they were studying any and all subjects, all aspects of all species from an evolutionary uh, perspective. And so evolution has this power of in integration and transcendence, which we really want to know about if we want to apply it to our own species. And so the big question is, are humans part of Darwin's tangled bank? Can we understand our own species in the same way that we can understand the rest of life? And can we even do this in an urban setting? Is it possible that the same principles that, that are used to understand the left-hand picture can also be used to understand the uh, right-hand picture? And when we ask this question, we encounter a puzzle which is that Darwin, going back to Darwin, he considered humans as part of the Tangle Bank from the very beginning. At the same time he was thinking about orchids and barnacles, he was thinking about human morality and the nature of human uh, emotions. And it was obvious to everyone in Darwin's day that if his theory was true, it would have tremendous consequences for our understanding of ourselves, and yet, by the early 20th century, the study of evolution had become restricted largely to the biological sciences and avoided for most human-related subjects. This was not true at the beginning, but it was true by the early 20th century. Why? I do not want to underestimate the complexity of these questions. We need good social historians to explain to us why it is that this happened. One major factor, as most of you know, is the use of evolution to justify social inequality. This became known as social Darwinism, and it was true in uh, America and, uh, and uh, England uh, even before it was true in Germany. So uh, we, we need to be very mindful of this, uh, of this uh, history. But another major factor that I want to concentrate on is a, a dichotomous view, extremely common, and I am certain that this is the kind of view which is uh, held by many people in this, uh, in this uh, 
space here, which on the one hand, we think about evolution, biology, and genes all wrapped up together, and we know that this explains the rest of life, uh, our own physical bodies, and maybe a few basic urges, such as to eat and to have sex. And then on the other side, we have our rich behavioral and cultural diversity, about which evolution has little to uh, say. And so this dichotomous thinking, which enables us to think that there's this whole set of issues concerning human behavioral and cultural diversity that somehow is outside the orbit of evolution, has enabled evolution to become sophisticated within the biological sciences, and the disciplines comprising the human-related subjects to all become sophisticated in their own way. These are smart people interacting with each other for many decades, but without reference to uh, evolution or to each other. And so the implicit assumption, you know, most of the people in this room and most of the people who seriously study humans are not young Earth creationists. And so implicitly what they're saying is, is that I believe in evolution, and what I think it must be consistent with evolution, but there is no explicit attempt to actually relate one's ideas to um, modern evolutionary theory. And in the absence of this theoretical framework, each discipline goes its separate way. In another one of my books, uh, Evolution for Everyone, I say that the ivory tower should be called the ivory archipelago, or maybe the ivory tower of Babel. All these disciplines, uh, islands of thought with little communication among islands. And this is such a pervasive problem that we take it for granted as if it cannot be otherwise. And yet, biology, evolutionary biology, provides a model showing that it can be otherwise. So like Sleeping Beauty, the study of evolution in relation to human fears took a long nap and uh, only seriously reawakened during the late 1980s and 1990s. I was just talking with Nick just before this event about a paper that he wrote in the 1970s about how human intelligence probably arose in the context of social behavior, social interactions with a selective force that were driving most, most of what we know about human intelligence. That, e that key insight, 1970s, 1970s, not so long, not so long um, ago. And if that's not exciting, uh, what is? It is a very exciting time to be an intellectual today. You name it, it's being studied from an evolutionary perspective. So every human-related discipline is being rethought from an evolutionary perspective. And there is a wonderful genre of books written by talented people for a general audience where all of us can partake in this feast, basically this intellectual feast um, of um, evolution in relation to uh, human uh, affairs. Now I want to quickly zip through what it means for an evolutionary biologist, someone such as myself trained uh, in graduate school to study zooplankton, those are those little creatures that live in the, wa in, the, in, the, in the water column, to become an evolutionist and to add that one last species to Darwin's tangled bank. And in just the same way that I and my colleagues will study any and all aspects of any and all species, we, all, we study any and all aspects of the human species not as dilettantes, not as amateurs, but at the highest level of professional discourse. Academic journals and books right up there because we have this great toolkit for studying all of these things from a single uh, perspective. And cooperation has been my subject for all species. Um, I'll be talking more about cooperation. And so, of course, we can study it in humans. And if you're not cooperating, you're doing something else. I hope you caught that great little nuance there, that uh, nice, little, um, uh, nice little triangle. Uh, individual differences. Uh, I don't know which kind of baby you were or which kind of baby you had, uh, but we're very different from each other and uh, we're very different coming out of the box. So, uh, you know, why is it that we're so different from each other? And did you know that other species are different too? That there's shy and bold sunfish and even shy and bold grasshoppers? That, there's, that the birds that differ greatly in the amount that they attend to information, so what we think of as personality, is something which exists in all, not all species, but many species, or why is it that there should be individual differences within any particular um, uh, species? Gossip is a wonderful, wonderful subject, understudied by any scientific 
discipline. It seems too cheap to study gossip. But in fact, gossip is one of the most important adaptations that we have. And the reason that we don't think more about it is because we all do it without knowing that we're doing it. What we know we're doing is the tip of the iceberg compared to what we don't know that what we're doing. And it turns out that gossip is an extremely important set of adaptations, more sophisticated and more moralistic than you might, than you might think. Well, here's uh, four friends. Take a look at them. And uh, I, want you to, I want you to very quickly uh, rate them for physical attractiveness. Physical attractiveness. How physically attractive are they? And if you're like me, you'd give them about a five on a scale from one to ten. They're not the most gorgeous specimens that, uh, that you'll find. If you ask them to rate each other's physical attractiveness, they will rate each other much higher than we have all rated them. And as it turns out, it's very interesting research that we've done which shows that, that physical attractiveness, the assessment of physical attractiveness is based only partially on physical factors. And it's based very largely on non-physical factors. We view someone, we do all of the aspects, physical and non-physical, and then that returns itself to us in an attraction or repulsion to them based on the whole package, basically, as represented in terms of physical um, attractiveness. Abraham Lincoln is one of my favorite examples of someone who was, who was ridiculed as ugly during his time. And now we love his face because of what it represents. And I was walking across campus uh, once, and there were two uh, women in front of me talking with each other. And one said to the other one, uh, if I didn't know him and hate him, I'd think he was cute. And so here's a beauty tip for men especially. Uh, be nice. Be a valuable social partner. And you will be regarded as more physically attractive. That is the best beauty tip that I can, that I can uh, give you. Decision-making is such an interesting subject. Who is the best decision-making unit, an individual or a group? And the answer to that question is quite complex, but something that we can understand from an evolutionary perspective. And we should want to, because as we know, decision-making can take very dysfunctional forms, as it is in our current political um, situation. Of course, we have these terrible health problems. Why is there an obesity epidemic? Now, why is it has this cultural distribution? Why does is, why is obesity have a distribution in the United States? And what this is, is it's an interaction between adaptations that evolved by genetic evolution, dietary adaptations that evolved by genetic evolution, which are now mismatched to our current dietary uh, um, environment. And there's no way to understand that mismatch except from an evolutionary uh, perspective. And cultural evolution itself, how is it that as a species we have this open-ended capacity for behavioral and cultural change? How is it that, that only 15,000 years ago, all of us were living a life that's represented as in this uh, uh, left-hand figure? And in only a few thousand years, over half of us, over half of the people on Earth, are now living in an environment similar to the right-hand uh, figure. The arts seem puzzling from an evolutionary perspective because superficially they seem non-utilitarian. It's easy to explain why we might make a bowl, but not why we might decorate a bowl. Why are we wasting energy dancing around and making noises that do not, do not uh, um, immediately lead to our survival and, and reproduction? And yet as soon as you understand cultural evolution and the importance of cultural evolution in our own species, and especially symbolic thought, the idea that all of us live in a world of symbolic representations, then the arts can be seen as actually vital for culture, not superfluous at all, not a byproduct, not a candy for the mind, a cheesecake for the mind, as my colleague uh, Steve Pinker uh, famously once, uh, uh, once put it. And of course, then there's the religion, a famous puzzle for the scientific and rational imagination. How is it possible for so many people to believe so much stuff that's not out there? and for which is no, there's no evidential basis. And as strange as it might seem, religion, a topic that I've been studying for a long time, uh, that transformation, rethinking topics from an evolutionary perspective, that started for the study of religion about 2002, less than 10 years ago. 
that the first books on religion from an evolutionary perspective came out. And 10 years later, as strange as it might seem, evolution has become the framework of choice for the scholarly study of religion. I was at a conference, an international conference for the histor history of religion in Toronto last year. And that conference was dominated by the message that, that historians of religion need to uh, study religion from an integrated, proximate, and ultimate evolutionary uh, perspective. It's uh, really extraordinary. And now we come to the main event of this talk, is how can we, can we use this theory, which is now including humans in the, stand, in, the, in the Tangle Bank, and can we actually use it to improve the quality of life in a, um, in a uh, practical sense? Can we put evolution to work? That's the subject of my new book, The, uh, the Neighborhood Project. And it, it reflects two things that I've been doing for the last five years. One is, is to use my city as a field site as an evolutionary ecologist would use the term. You know, what would it be like to study chimps without Gombe Park and the other field sites for studying chimps? What would it mean, what would it be like to study the Galapagos finches without the Galapagos? The foundation of evolutionary research is to study organisms in relation to their environment, and yet people are typically not studied in relation to their everyday lives. And the disciplines that do that the most, such as sociology and cultural anthropology, are the very same disciplines that are most avoidant of evolution, or at least have been in the past. And so studying humans in their natural environment, or at least in their co contemporary environment, is something which is not being done enough. And we're now starting to do that, studying people from all walks of life as they go about their daily lives from an evolutionary pers perspective. And then a think tank for uh, formulating public policy from an evolutionary perspective in general terms, uh, something that started um, uh, four years ago, and uh, we're now making amazing progress studying major policy issues from an evolutionary uh, perspective. So here I am uh, looking somewhat forlorn in my city of Binghamton, which uh, uh, was actually just experienced the worst flood of its history only about three, uh, three weeks ago. And what is the toolkit that I bring to uh, this kind of community-based research? Uh, this is an article that appeared in New Scientist also a little bit early this year on this question of, of cooperation, altruism, prosociality. The big puzzle here is, is how can the behaviors that we associate with niceness in all of its forms, how can those behaviors which basically help others survive and reproduce, how can they succeed in a Darwinian world? We need to go back to the time of our genetic evolution, and we need to think about the ancestral human social environment. And this is such an important point, is that the, our genetic social environment, the social environment in which we evolved genetically, are small face-to-face -face groups. If you want to understand our psychology, you have to understand it in the context of small face-to-face -face groups faced with important shared objectives and with the availability of low-cost social control, back to gossip, so that you couldn't misbehave too much because there were too many other individuals that were available to keep you in line. And it turns out that low-cost social control is more important than genetic relatedness. And the history of evolution has been a big emphasis on kin selection and genetic relatedness as the cause for, as the explanation for altruism. But in many species, including the social insects and our own species, what really causes groups to function as adaptive units is low-cost social control. And the ideas that um, have um, accumulated based on these evolutionary considerations for our genetic evolution as a species turn out to be highly consilient with this person, Eleanor Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2009 for showing that, uh, that uh, a common resource situations, people, people faced with uh, uh, utilizing common resources, that need not always result in a tragedy. People are, are capable of managing their own affairs in current real world groups, but only if certain conditions are met. And what Eleanor Ostrom did, not just theoretically, but, but empirically, working with groups around the world that are attempting to manage natural resources of various kinds, is she identified a number of design features which account for their success. 
And those design features are very highly consilient with the evolutionary dynamics of cooperation in general and the history of our species. I'm not going to list these design features. I'm going to list you a recipe for how groups can function well. And what I want you to notice when you look, when you, when you, when you read through this list, you're going to notice two things. First of all, they're all familiar. There will be no surprises. Secondly, think about the groups that you're engaged in, especially neighborhoods, and ask yourself the question, even though these design features are familiar, how often are they met? How often do they actually exist in real world groups? This is an amazing how-to how -to list for causing groups to function well, not just the groups that Eleanor Ostrom studied, but just about any group of any scale. As a matter of fact, I was giving a talk in Europe only a few weeks ago, and Eric Beinhacher, a well-known economist who studied a book, who wrote a book called The Origin of Wealth, uh, was in the audience, and he, he came up afterward, he said, those design principles are exactly what's ailing the European Union right now. These design principles are scale independent. And so we're taking these principles and we're putting them to use in the city of Binghamton, and we're also measuring uh, prosociality, solid citizen behavior, at a citywide scale. What you see here is the city of Binghamton. Um, the city limits, there's two rivers that come together. That's why we had the flood. And what you're seeing is like a topography of dark hills and light valleys. Those are not geographical hills and valleys. Those are hills and valleys of prosociality. Those reflect neighborhoods in which the average member of the neighborhood is a solid citizen or not. And I love this map. I love the maps that we create because they look just like the distribution and abundance of a species, don't they? This could be a plant species if you were an ecologist. And what it shows is, is that if you take a human behavioral strategy, a pro-social strategy or a non-pro-social strategy, those strategies have a distribution and abundance, just like a species. And if we want to increase pro-sociality, what we need to do is we need to understand the environment that favors pro-sociality as an evolutionary strategy. We need to provide that environment, and humans are flexible and conditional enough so they will respond to an environmental change if you know what that change is, and they will become more pro-social so that we have the prospect of raising the valleys into hills until the entire city of Binghamton is sitting on a hill of pro-sociality. Pro At least that is possible in principle. And one of the ways we're doing this in the neighborhoods is a collaboration with the city called the Design Your Own Park Competition. And here's how it works. I think you'll recognize the uh, Ostrom design principles. Just like a hunter-gatherer society has all these common things that they have to do, we need to provide a common goal for a neighborhood. Now, there's a lot of negative things that a neighborhood can get together to work on. But how about something positive? How about building your dream park? And this space right here is such a space for this neighborhood. And so what we do is we make vacant spaces available. We, let, we get the neighborhoods to compete. Competition is a good thing. A soft competition can be a good thing if you manage it correctly. And then we have a coaching process and an incentive system so that we build in the design features. And most neighborhoods do not have those design features. How many neighborhoods have a strong group identity? even get together or inclusive enough to get together to make a consensus decision. So all of these things we can build in more than they currently um, exist. And so here's uh, one of the uh, parks designed by uh, one of the neighborhoods which is currently being implemented. You can see how much fun they had in designing it and, uh, and how much work it is to build it. But that work is useful because what you're really trying to create is a social process. Now, uh, three weeks ago, that uh, park was under four feet of water. And this provided an interesting opportunity because the group that had gotten together and formed a, to build the park was now organized to help with flood relief. And so this neighborhood was actually better able to help itself with respect to flood relief thanks to the organization that had become established through the park. We'd really created a kind of a social, in just the same way that, a, that an ecologist would stabilize shifting soil by planting 
plant, by, by seeding plants, we had stabilized the social environment enough so that when a crisis hit, we were able actually to, they were actually able to um, uh, cooperate more than they had uh, otherwise. Okay, I'm gonna finish up with our big, biggest success story. I'm so excited about this, uh, um, this project. Here are some residents of, uh, of uh, Binghamton, uh, a motley crew of teenagers. Uh, they've actually formed a dance troupe and if you see there's a guy in the back that looks a little bit out of place, that's the mayor of Binghamton. <laughs> and they have just finished performing for the mayor of Binghamton, and so they're in a festive mood. But actually, most of these kids are not doing well in school at all. And so last year, we were asked by the Binghamton City School District to design a, help them to design a program for at-risk ninth and 10th grader. It's called the Regents Academy. And we had a chance to do some social engineering, to build a program now in the context of a, uh, a program for at-risk youth, which, which stacks the deck in favor of pro-sociality and long-term learning outcomes. And so we explicitly uh, tried to build in the Austrian design features. Another important principle is the distinction between a safe and secure environment and a, uh, and a harsh, insecure environment. It turns out that people and many other species are well adapted for both environments. So in a harsh environment, people don't fall apart. They behave adaptively in harsh environments. And typically what that means is, is that you live for the moment. You, the, what's, what's important is to survive and reproduce another day, not, to, not for long-term outcomes. And so what you need for long-term learning outcomes is to have a, a playful, safe, and secure environment. If you don't have that, then you're unlikely to get an outcome. And then there's also a lot of learning principles that follow from evolutionary theory, which seem uh, straightforward, except so often we don't do them. For example, no, no species, including our own, learns things easily when all the costs are in the present and all the benefits are in the future. Learning has to be reinforcing over the short term. Uh, there's a wonderful book by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the psychologist who's best known for his book, Flow, uh, which studies peak psychological um, experience. And what that book did was it followed gifted uh, students. These are the ones on the other half of the bell curves. These are the, these are the most gifted students in ninth grade. And Csikszentmihalyi followed them from the ninth grade to the twelfth grade to see how many of them had fulfilled their gifts four years later, and how many of them had become merely average. And the primary, primary insight of that longitudinal study was that the, the kids, the gifted kids that remained gifted four years later were the ones who enjoyed what they were doing on a day-to-day -day basis. It didn't matter that you were identified as gifted in science or math or something like that if you didn't like it on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's, perhaps, it's in part for that reason that gifted artists remain gifted more than gifted scientists because art is fun on a day-to-day -day basis more than science typically, typically is. And if that's true for the most gifted students, you can bet it's true even more for the, uh, for the other part of the, other part of the uh, bell curve. And so we took all that we knew as evolutionists and we packed it into this program. Now there's a very important distinction that I want to make between the design principles, the functional design of a group, and how that functional design is implemented. And Eleanor Ostrom discovered this in her own work. Basically, take any design principle, such as monitoring, and there's many different ways that you can do that. And it turns out that the best way is usually highly contingent on local conditions. So you can give somebody the list of design features, but you cannot give them the list of implementations. That is very much up to them. And this is one reason why groups need to have the authority to do it their way, because they're the only ones that know which particular implementation is likely to work. And so that there's a lot of local creativity that goes into taking the list of design principles and um, and implementing them. If you're an evolutionist, what I'm talking about here is the, the many-to-one relationship between proximate and ultimate causation. There's many ways to skin a cat. And for any adaptation, for anything that works and is functional, there's many different ways to 
implemented, and that needs to be uh, uh, implemented. Okay, now another important point to make here is the need to assess things scientifically. And the, the gold standard of assessment is a randomized control trial. So we had 60 kids in this program. We didn't just recruit 60 kids. We recruited 120 kids. We randomly selected them. And then we had a control group that went right back to the high school. And we had a proper comparison for uh, if our, our program um, worked. And so here are the results. These are the class grades for the Regents Academy and the comparison group, and you can see that what happened was, was that the performance of the Regents Academy students just popped up like a cork during the first quarter. We had provided the right environment, and they had responded, not gradually, but immediately. This, this is the best comparison, because this is the state-mandated exams, and what this shows is, for four subjects, that not only did the Regents Academy students greatly outperform the comparison groups, that's the first and third bar in each grant, in each, uh, in each uh, section, but the Regents Academy students, who in their previous year had failed at least three of their courses, had actually performed on a par with the average high school student in the Binghamton High School District. This program had erased the deficits of um, of um, years, and this is uh, uh, going to be published uh, shortly in uh, PLOS One, a very good scientific journal. So this seems like a miracle compared to previous efforts. How is it possible that you can take a recalcitrant problem such as this, and you can actually have this kind of a transformation? And, and, and very quickly, this is like, you know, like, imagine a chameleon, you want to change the color of the chameleon, but you're not going to change the background environment. How easy is that going to be? How easy is it going to be if you do change the background environment? And so knowing the right kind of environmental intervention can work. So now let me quickly summarize what I've tried to do here. First of all, I've tried to very quickly tell you the meaning of Darwin's tangled egg. Why is evolution such a powerful theory for the rest of life? The fact that we can include humans as part of Darwin's tangled bank. And now we can use that in a practical sense, basically, to improve the quality of life in cities and all other populations. So thank you very much. I'm glad to have spent this time with you.